welcome back everybody to our very last session of the Linked Data and Semantic Web for Humanities Research short LISA 2021 Spring School funded by Claria AT and co-organized by the Center for Information Modeling at the University of Katz and the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. We end with a lecture by John McRae with the title Introduction to Ontolab's Lemon Model. John McRae is a lecturer above the bar at the National University of Ireland, Galway, whose work has focused on the intersection of natural language processing and data science and has led the development of the linguistic linked open data cloud, a large scale integration of many language resources. He received his PhD for the National Institute of Informatics in Tokyo in Japan and worked as a postdoc until 2015, uh, working on the Monet, Portadile and LIDA projects. He is currently the coordinator of the Linguistic Linked Open Data LLOD project on making linguistic linked, uh, linguistic linked open data ready to use, as well as a work package leader in the Alexis project on a European lexicographic infrastructure. I'm really happy that you are here at our school and uh, looking forward to your talk. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to follow on from where Thierry was were left off um, before the coffee break. Um, and he started, we started introducing this idea of the Ontolex Lemon model. So we're really going to focus in on this model, which is sort of the, the now the, the kind of de facto way of representing um, lexical information, so dictionary-like information um, using linked data. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we designed the model and how, how we got to it. So it's something that has been under development for a long time. It, it started off with some independent work. Um, so Linginfo from Paul Beuteler, Lex Onto was from Philip Simiano, and the Linguistic Information Repository, or LIR, was developed um, in Madrid by Elena Montiel from Soda. Um, and these three people sort of came together, realized that they were trying to solve the same problem. Um, and we had a project called Monet. Um, which led first to the LexInfo model, which Thierry mentioned a little bit, um, but then finally to this kind of um, core model called Monet Lemon, which is basically the model that I'm going to talk about today that was released in 2011. Um, but the important thing was that we felt that this was not a very um, good way to develop a model without lots of input. So we um, founded an open community group called the Ontolex community group that, that's still going to this day and still very active. Um, and this group kind of worked on building the community and really kind of finalizing the model. Um, and it, that took a while. It took, it took four years to get to the final specification of the core model, but in 2016, we released the, the final specification of the core model. Um, and we continue to extend it. There was a lexicography module um, released in 2019, and there's a few more modules in the pipeline. So it's still under active development. And, you know, this is something that still goes on. And, if you're interested, you can be part of this. It's very easy to join the community group. Um, so when we designed the models, we kind of had five general rules or five kind of key requirements. Um, first of all, we wanted this obviously to be a linked data model, which meant that we're going to use the existing linked data standards, such as the web ontology language and the RDF. Um, we obviously wanted this to support multilinguality. So we wanted it to be able to represent multiple languages and also not to make any kind of strong assumptions that might stop this model working for other languages. We had this fundamental idea of semantics by reference. This is this idea that we know what a word means, not because we have some kind of definition or some kind of formal model, but because we have an ontology and we can link to this ontology. So we use this idea of linked data also for our meaning. You know, a meaning of a word is simply a link to a, an entity in an ontology. Um, we highly prized openness. Um, we have two meanings of openness. So first of all, we're open in the sense that it, you know, it's, it's free, as in free speech, you know, it's, it's open, you don't have to pay money to download it and anyone could contribute to it. Um, but it's also open in the sense that it's a flexible model that doesn't, you know, too much try to limit the, um, the, um, the set of, of things you can represent. So it, it's very extensible and, and very open model that you can you can build as you wish. Um, finally, we wanted to reuse relevant standards. You know, there's always a danger of, you know, not invented here syndrome, always trying to reinvent the wheel. But we wanted to try to use existing models and use everything 
it was already there um, as well as we could. So I'll go a bit into sort of motivating and describing the, the model in some more detail. Um, so one thing we've seen is that, you know, in terms of ontologies, we have ontologies in an owl and they can use logic to represent concepts. And, you know, we're pretty good in general at representing logic using things like description logics. Um, but ontologies were fairly poor at representing um, language. Um, and in fact, the only way you can do it is through a single string that can be marked with a language tag. So for example, you can say that this word is language in English or perhaps in, you know, in, in Irish, um, it could be a word changa. Um, but, you know, for a language that's, that's very inflectional like Irish, you know, having a lemma form like changa might not be very useful for a computer because it might appear, it might appear in text in a very different form. So, you know, this word changa actually appears below in this text as changa, which is quite different in terms of, of the surface form. So we're much less good um, at representing linguistic information. So this was the kind of gap that we wanted to, um, to close um, with the introduction of this model. So when we're talking about linked data on the web, you know, what we see is we have a concept we want to define. So in this case, we have this concept of edema. It's a medical symptom. Um, and what we can do is we, we define it by giving it URLs. You know, this is the, the key idea of linked data. So we can use standard resource or you can use resources such as DBpedia, um, you know, and DBpedia also has, you know, multiple language versions. So we could have an internationalized um, URL such as this um, German link for the concept. Um, and we can also use standard categories. So, you know, in uh, terms of medical terminology, the MESH, the subject headings, um, the UMLS is the universal medical language service and the ICD is the international classification of diseases. So these are standard catalogs and they have identifiers. So we can have URLs, we can identify all of these concepts. Um, and that's fine for defining what, what edema means, but edema is a bit of an, an odd word in English. First of all, it has an unusual plural because of its Greek, um, heritage, Greek um, etymology. So the plural of edema is etymata. And there's also other, you know, synonyms like dropsy um, that are used. And, you know, what we do is we have all of these, you know, linguistic terms, edema, edamata, dropsy. We have all of these URLs and different resources and we can connect them all together and we get, you know, a mess because we have to connect everything to everything. You know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of triples um, and it's not very, it's not very effective. Um, so it wouldn't be better if we had, you know, a concept of a lexical entry, a named URI to represent the idea of the word. Um, and this also gives us an advantage that we can then group words or group forms that are closely related. So we can say that edema and edamata are both forms of the same lexical entry. And dropsy is another lexical entry with a form of dropsy. Um, and we can link this to each of the concepts. And as you see, it, it's much neater and it needs fewer triples, but it better captures this concept of, you know, there being, there being multiple terms and really kind of modeling, you know, a word as a word. So, you know, we're doing this typical semantic web linked data thing that when, you know, when we want to define something, what we do is we give it a URL. So we have now have a URL that represents not the string, but the, the concept of this word. So as a dictionary, uh, sorry, as an entry in a dictionary effectively. So that, that's good. If that was all it is, then, you know, it would be done. But I, I think there's a bit more to this. So, you know, we don't have to really think about what a lexical entry is. Um, so a lexical entry, the, this is the, the definition we decided on um, in Ontolex. So I'll read it out here. A lexical entry represents a unit of analysis of the lexicon that consists of a set of forms that are grammatically related and a set of base meanings that are associated with these forms. Thus, a lexical entry is a, a word, multi-word expression, or affix with a single part of speech, morphological pattern, etymology, and set of senses. So this is our kind of idea of, of the definition of what a lexical entry is. So it can have multiple forms, but they have to be somehow kind of grammatically related. They have to sort of have the same meanings, more or less. So, you know, you have to be able to 
say that, you know, all of these forms, like, you know, are different forms of edema and edemata, all refer to the same concept. So we have to have this idea that, you know, that the forms, that any of these forms can match to any of these meanings, and that's sort of the, the key idea. Um, and we also specified some, some stronger um, um, rules about, you know, what, what happens linguistically, but they have to have the same part of speech. They have to have the same morph morphology, so for example, the same plural. They have to have the same etymology, so etymologically they have to be the same word. This is something that we see in a lot of dictionaries. Um, you'd have different entries for different etymologies of the same word. Um, so, you know, and, you know, the, these kind of stronger linguistic criteria are, you know, what we use as part of defining um, the meaning of a word or defining what a lexical entry is. Um, so I'll give a few more examples. Um, so, you know, one thing we, we realize is that, you know, one of the limitations of linked data or one of the, the design things in linked data is that you can't directly describe a string. Um, so let's say we wanted to be a bit more, more detailed about the difference between edema and edemata. We want to say that one is, a, one is a plural and one is a singular. So because we can't directly have a triple where the string is the subject, we need to introduce another URI. They say this is a typical semantic web linked data thing to do. If we want to define a concept, we define a URI. So we can now define a URI that represents that form. So it acts as a proxy for this form. So we can now say that the edemata form, and we can add a triple to that form that says the number is plural. And the edema form, we can add a triple that says the number for this is singular. So now we have a an a URL for the entry, but also we can have URLs for each of the individual forms of this entry. Similarly, we can do something with the mapping to the concepts. Um, and this is what we refer to in Ontolex as a lexical sense. Um, so, you know, I mean, sense has, you know, many meanings in itself um, and different people interpret it differently. There's a very specific meaning in Ontolex, but sense represents this sort of assigning a URL to the link between edema, link between the lexical entry edema and the concept, say, in an ontology like DBpedia. Um, now, why might you want to do this? Well, you might want to actually have some kind of um, annotation on this link. Um, so a typical annotation might be, you know, to say that this is an old term, that dropsy is not widely used to refer to edema and is more commonly actually used to refer to another concept that is a disease of fish. So essentially, what we're doing here is we're, we're assigning now another URL, so another URI, um, that defines this concept of the sense, which is essentially the mapping between the lexical entry and the concept in the ontology. And it allows us to describe things about this mapping. Um, so when we put this all together, we now have the string, we have a URL for the form, we have a URL for the entry, we have a URL for the sense, and of course, we have a URL in the ontology. So we have four URLs um, basically describing this one string, which seems like a lot of complexity, but I kind of, you know, I think it makes sense. Um, and we, of course, we found it in many modelings, you know, these things are very useful. Um, okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of a break here, and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, um, Pull up a little quiz. So I'm going to go back to this definition of lexical entry. So important things to remember, it's a set of forms that are grammatically related based with a set of common set of meanings with a single part of speech, morphology, and etymology. So I'm going to play a little game about, you know, understanding, you know, what is a lexical entry and, and what, what is important here. This is a question about kind of lexical entries and onto Lex Lemon. And the basic question I'm going to ask every time is really, are these the same lexical entry? So for example, work and works, um, assume they're both nouns or both verbs. Um, so, you know, are these two forms of the same lexical entry or would you model them as different lexical entries? So you tick the red triangle if you think they're the same lexical entry, hint, hint, or you tick the blue diamond if you think they're different. Yeah, so I mean, you know, this is, you know, exactly the same as the um, example here of edema and edemata, it's a singular and a plural, right? So, you know, these are the same lexical entries. So we model them as the same lexical entry with two different forms. 
So I hope the six people who put different kind of get that unity, you know, this is just, you know, singular and plural are, you know, definition of the same kind of form. Um, okay, we have a leaderboard as well. So how about work and worker? Do you think these are the same thing? Would you open a dictionary and, well, you might get them under the same entry, but, you know, we're looking at things like, you know, part of speech and etymology and morphology. And do you think these represent the same kind of, the same basic word? Yeah, yeah they're, they're definitely different, right? I mean, work is a verb. I mean, it can also be a noun, but, you know, worker is, is this. And, you know, this idea that they have a different set of meanings, a worker means something different to, to a work. Um, so they'd obviously have to refer to this different concepts. Okay, good. So how about work and unwork? Again, here we really think about the meanings, you know, do these have the same set of meanings? You know, is this a grouping of, of words that makes sense as, you know, having the same meaning or is, is there some change in meaning between these? Yeah, I mean, again, these, these are very different meanings. Like they're both verbs, but, you know, they're obviously very different in terms of meaning. So, you know, as most of you said, these are, these are different lexical entries. So how about noun work and the verb work? Are they the same lexical entry? And we'll look back at the definition. Are they the same here? So are they the same, the red triangle, or are they different to blue diamond? Different. Yeah, I mean, we say it quite clearly in the definition, they have to have a single part of speech. So we can't have a noun and a verb as the same lexical entry. That's kind of in the definition. How about Paris in English? Is that going to be the same lexical entry as Paris in French? Congratulations for your pronunciation. <laughs> I actually did five years of French at high, uh, at high school and I uh, still rather shut it. <laughs> ah, most of them are the same. Yeah, I, I'm surprised. I mean, the fact that they're pronounced differently should give it away. But I mean, you know, having lexical entries or on the same language, it, it's going to having lexical entries of the same because different languages is going to cause problems in morphology. It's not going to be the same etymology, obviously, because, you know, different languages. You know, and a lot of these kind of ideas of these being grammatically related. I don't think so. So they're definitely, I think you should definitely use different lexical entries for different languages. So how about AI and artificial intelligence? Would they be the same lexical entry? So the abbreviation and the full form of it. Particularly think about the morphology here, you know. Do these always have the same morphology? Yeah, again, it's, it's different because, I mean, this one's more controversial, but, you know, we tend, we, we recommend you model them separately in Ontolex just because of the morphology issues, um, that the way these words will inflect, you know, particularly, you know, if you're in a language, you know, like German, where you have to deal with, you know, adjective, adjectival agreements, um, you know, there's going to be different morphological aspects for the short and the long form. So, you know, they should really be different lexical entries. Okay, how about work as in the copy machine works and Sue works hard? Are this, is this the same lexical entry? This idea of, you know, having a, a single set of senses. Yeah, so I mean, this, this is a case of, you know, these are two senses of work, but it's the same lexical entry. You know, a lexical entry can have multiple senses. Um, and that's not a problem, like we saw, you know, with the example of, of dropsy referring to two different things, but it's still a single lexical entry. So again, you know, two senses of work, same lexical entry. Myers, Myers in the lead. 
not getting caught by the tricky one. How about lead, uh, sorry, lead as in lead windows and lead as in lead the charge? Are these going to be the same lexical entry? No, they're, they're, they're quite obviously different. I mean, one's a noun, one's a verb, you know, they're pronounced different. You know, there's obviously differences in etymology, differences, probably differences in morphology in many languages where you have these kind of um, uh, homo um, not homophones, um, homographs. Um, so homographs are definitely different entries. Okay. How about color and color spelt with the British and the American spelling? Would they be the same entry? Different form or the same form? Is this a single form of the entry? This one's a little bit tricky. Um, Ah, yeah. So no, no one got it. So most of we went the same entry, but different form, which, which makes sense. Um, but in fact, you know, the, the criteria for different forms, you know, is to do with them being grammatically related. Um, and, you know, colour and colour are, are not grammatically related. They're, orth they're just orthographic variants. So we actually model them as part of the same form. But, you know, I know this one's very tricky and most people get it wrong. But it's something that, you know, in the modeling, we actually try to group together these spelling variants. So that we're focused on the grammar and the morphology rather than the um, spelling and you know, thing of this. Finally, and this one's very tricky. Um, bank as in Bank of Ireland against bank as in River Bank. Is this going to be the same entry? So. Given you a bit of a, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't expect you to know it off the top of your head. Um, so there are in fact different entries, but I also gave you this, this cheat option with the yellow. It depends on the etymology, because of course the, um, this word in Bank of Ireland is derived from um, Italian, banca meaning bench, um, whereas river bank is, uh, you know, it's a Germanic word that has come into English, well, it's been in English um, since it was Anglo-Saxon, right? So in fact, they're two different entries, but um, it's because of the etymology principally that would make them two different entries. So you're right if you got both of these. Okay, so let's see who our winner is. So me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you came third, whoever you are. Um, I'm not gonna try to pronounce the second place name. And Maya wins overall, eight out of 10. So good job. So. I Congratulations to Maya, there's virtual prizes, but you know. Um, but hopefully this got you to, to look, think a little bit about kind of lexical entries and some of the kind of modeling decisions that we make. Okay, so I've got, I guess about 20 minutes left. So it should be okay to just kind of go a bit now through the, the details of the model. So we'll look at some more modeling examples with real code. Um, so this is the, the core model. Um, so this is what we discussed before. There's these four URLs, the URL for the form, the URL for the lexical entry, URL for the lexical sense, and the ontology. Um, there's a few other things. We also have lexical concept, which is an alternative to the ontology. It represents a more, a more kind of loose definition. Um, and we allow some things like, you know, skipping over the sense by having a link directly between the entry and the ontology. Um, so a simplest form of kind of a, a ontolex entry looks something like this. This is in turtle syntax. Um, I don't know if you've seen a lot of turtle um, so far in this course, but you know, hopefully it's not too hard to understand. Um, we use a URL namespace, so it's a w3.org namespace, um, and this is the standard you know namespace for ontolex. Um, and we start by saying cat is a word. Its canonical form is written as cat in English. Um, so we use the language tag here, even though the lexical entry only has a single language, we do the language tag here. Um, and we can give a definition with the denotes property. So it denotes something that is defined as a four-legged furry animal. So very simple, we have a word with a form and a definition. Fairly straightforward. We can further do this by adding um, um, in grammatical information. 
So grammatical information is added with a ontology, with Lexinfo um, ontology, and this is the URL for the 2.0 version, which is actually out of date now. Um, and we can add in facts about this. So we can say on the lexical entry level, that it's part of speech is now. And then we can add the, this, con, um, this um, canonical form. So this is the main form of it, which then add the property this has number, number singular. So we're adding this triple that the canonical form has number singular. And we can add a variant form, in this case, cats. We can say this is the plural. So we can just use another ontology like lexinfo in order to add you know, general grammatical information onto the forms, onto the senses, onto the lexical entry, onto anything we like. Um, so we can also have multiple lexical senses. Um, lexical senses. So we have, for example, here two words, bulrush and cattail. Um, so that's a kind of plant. Um, I'll have a picture in a minute. Um, and they both refer to um, a DVPD concept, which is with a more with the Latin name typha. Um, but we can, you can, we can describe the usage of these senses. So we can say bulrush. We can add a usage note that says this is British English term. And we have cattail, which is an American English. So obviously, unlike color and color, where it's the same word, um, just written differently in British and American English here, British and American English actually uses um, uh, different terms. So they're different lexical entries. And we can say that, you know, and so we can have this kind of sense reference path. This is the, we had the notes before where we used one triple to link the word to the ontology. Now we're using two. And the advantage is we now have a, a nameable um, URI element for the sense that we can add information like usage. Um, and we do this particularly to provide a restriction to say, you know, particularly when is this, when is a particular word used to refer to this concept? Um, and this is a picture of bull rushes, by the way, if you, we're wondering what, what plant it is. They grow in, they grow in ponds. Um, so in addition to the core module, we had some kind of um, extra modules that allow you to model um, more facts. So one is sort of syntax and semantics. So this allows us to link um, sentences with triples. So we can take a sentence like John knows Thierry. And we want to realize that it's, you know, realized as a triple, you know, you're out of my um, Ferraf profile, and it says Ferraf knows Thierry de Klerk. Um, so this is what the module looks like. It adds on to the lexical entry and lexical sense, concepts of a syntactic frame, syntactic arguments, and an ontology mapping. Um, so what we do is we, we add in a frame. So we say the word now has a be syntactic behavior, which is transitive. And this transitive frame has a subject and a direct object. Um, you see, note when we're using modules, the modules have a different URL to the core. So we have an ontolex for the core, and then we have a different URL for the module. So they're independent. And we just define the syntactic frame. Um, we can then find, define the semantic frame. The semantic frame is also utilizing the lexical sense. So the lexical sense is also an ontology mapping. Um, and it says that the subject of the property for of nose is the same as the subject of the verb, and the object of the property for of nose is the same as the direct object of the verb. So we're encoding the information that was on this slide. This is the subject of the property. This is the object of the property. This is the subject of the verb. This is the direct object of the verb. And it could be the other way around, right? You know, you could imagine that there's verbs um, which work the other way around to the triple. Um, so we're just encoding this within the frame. So what we get is something that looks a bit like this. We have our lexical entry, which is attached to a syntactic frame and attached to an ontology mapping and a sense. This refers to a property in our ontology. Um, and we have this kind of argument that is linked to by both the syntactic frame and to the ontology map. And the linking from the ontology map says that it occurs as subject position in the ontology. And the linking from the syntactic frame says it occurs as subject position in the sentence. And so I mean, the link here to this argument object says that this is the object of the triple and the direct object of the verb. Um, and we also then have the ontology can then give us more restrictions like domain and range restrictions on the property um, using RDFS domain and RDFS range. Um, 
Okay, and I'm not sure if you've seen this um, in other modeling, but um, you know, this allows us to say that nose is a property that's between two humans, for example, two persons. So another model we have is decomposition. So, you know, we have a typical case of a, a, a German term here, like qualitative management system. Um, and we notice that this is made up of course three words, qualitative, management, and system. Um, but there's also some interesting phenomena here, like this S, you know, never occurs independently with the word qualitet. Qualitet by itself doesn't work in German. So you have these very specific kind of phenomena in the word um, composition. So we have this module um, called decomp, um, which basically adds component. And this component allows us to describe how a lexical entry is decomposed. Um, so for example, here we have, you know, the English term summer school, we can say is a multi-word expression, and we can just say it's directly composed of summer and school. So just a direct link to the two um, entries for summer and school. But in a maybe a more complex example here, we have say the French, école d'été, um, which is composed of three words, école de and été. Um, and we can specify the order of these words even, so we can even say that, that the actual order, if this matter, if this is something we want to know, um, is école, then de, then été. Um, and we can even add specific information about the component. So we can say that the component here, de, in the context of this um, expression, so within the expression école d'été, the word de is actually a contraction. This is because we see it's shortened to D apostrophe because of the um, vowel at the start of ete. So we can say something more um, sophisticated about how this particular term is composed. Um, finally, we have, well, not finally, we have a variation and translation module. Um, so this allows us to represent linkings across languages and you know, variation within languages. Um, so a typical example here is we might have a Japanese term, mochi, um, which is probably best translated into English as mochi, but you might use a, a kind of a, a gloss translation of Japanese rice cake, which you know, isn't a very literal translation of the Japanese, but um, it's maybe more useful for people who aren't familiar with the concept. So we have this idea of kind of cultural translation. Um, so we actually allow you to represent translation in lots of ways. So this adds all kinds of modeling for linking at lexical level, linking at sense level, um, linking at conceptual level, adding terminological relations, sets of translations. So a lot of things to, to help model multiple language translations. Um, and in fact, in Ontolex, there are, there are basically um, four ways to represent a translation. So here we have an example of an entry for rice and a corresponding word in Japanese, kome. Um, we have two senses, and when we have it referring to a single um, ontology concept here, Wikipedia rice. Um, so this is our first method. We know these are translations because they refer to the same ontology. These words have the same meaning, therefore they must be translations. Um, we can also do this by directly linking the senses. Um, so this allows us to state, state which perhaps senses of rice and kome uh, match. So if there were other, if we modeled other senses of rice that don't translate into kome as Japanese, we can say which particular senses by adding explicit, explicit link. Um, we can also do this semantic web thing or, you know, maybe we want to say more about our translation. We want to say who did the translation, when it was done, for example. So what we do is we do this semantic web thing of introducing a URL. So we can have a URL that names a specific translation. So we call this a standoff translation where we have um, this linking the senses. Um, and finally, we can even directly link kind of at the entry level. Um, this has the disadvantage that it doesn't say which particular meanings of, of rice are translated as kome, um, but we can add a direct link here to say that these are sometimes translated as one another. So we have four different ways of doing translation, um, depending on, on the need and you know, what makes sense in, in the application. Um, the final module that was introduced when in 2016 was the metadata module. Um, so this was motivated by this idea of there being, and this was really the motivating example was there being a wizard and a djinn who wanted to talk about magic. Um, and, you know, they don't have the same ontology, but they both have lemon models associated with their ontologies of magic. 
um, and they can use the fact that they've got metadata in order to understand how they might talk to one another. Um, so the metadata module adds a lot of properties that describe things about, about the um, Ontelex models, like you know the number of lexical entries, the number of senses, how many links, how many links on average do you have um, per sense or per lexical entry. So it adds a lot of you know metadata statistics. Okay, um, and yeah, in addition, as I said, the module is the model is continuing to develop. There's some very um, active um, work going on in terms of the development of new modules. Um, so this link, this list is, I think, even a little out of date. I think there's a few more modules in the pipeline. Um, the morphology module is is under very active development at the moment, um, and should be released soon. Uh, the lexicography module has been released, although there's already calls for further extensions to it. Um, we have a module which we're calling FRAC for frequency um, attribution and corpus information, which is essentially about linking dictionaries with corpus. So you have attestations of particular words and you know connections to corpus information. Um, also, there's representations of word embeddings. Um, and both the morphology and the frac telcos have um, currently telcos every two or three weeks. So in both modules have telcos every two or three weeks, kind of finalizing these. So if you're interested, please jump in. Um, and then coming down the pipeline, there's interest in looking at better modelings of etymology um, and how to model diachronic change in the lexicon. Um, there's the lexinfo model for lexicosyntactic categories, which is something that you know is still under development and anyone can contribute to. Um, so this is all kind of you know coming together and you know you're welcome to join and if you do please if you do feel like joining you simply go to w3.org slash community slash ontolex um, and if you do this there should be a button here which says join the group or leave the group um, you need to create an account and everything but it's free to do anyone can join and you know you'll see there's there's lots of activity in the group and regular regular calls. So please feel free to join and feel free to contribute if any of this is interesting to you. Okay, so I'd say thank you. Um, recognize the, the funders. I'm majorly funded by um, Science Foundation Ireland through the ADAPT and the Insight Centers, um, as well as Alexis um, through the EU, and of course the Pretelod project that I haven't added here, which I'm coordinating, which is also EU funded. So Thank you. Um, and are there any questions? Many thanks, John, for your ex excellent lecture. I think the game showed quite well, in my opinion, what the domain is about. And as we heard in the during the school, that knowing your domain and knowing the uh, models is something very, very important. Um, did any questions arise during the presentation, or are there any comments? So I have one small uh, short question. Um, I have I don't have a background in linguistics, but I have a background in history. So could you also use your model to somehow work with historical sources to express the the meaning, the different uh, versions or varieties of historical terms and words? Could that be a use case too? That's a use case. So I mean, actually, I, I mentioned it in the, in the modules that this is something that we're looking into, um, diachronic representations. Um, and I mean, I, I think that there's challenges because of how meaning shifts. Um, if you're if you're interested in this, um, one of the people who's very active on this is um, Fahad Khan at the um, Institute for Computational Linguistics in Pisa. Um, so he's had some papers on potential models for representing, um, you know, semantic shifts and language um, language change within um, the Ontolex model. Um, so there's some work there. Um, there's nothing that we've got to the point of, you know, kind of officially releasing yet, but it's it's something that we're, we're definitely very interested in. And for my personal research as well, I have a couple of PhD students who are very interested in looking at um, how how um, Irish um, has evolved from sort of from about the um, sixth, seventh, eighth century um, up to the modern day. So this is certainly something that we're looking into. Thank you very much. 
Is there another question or comment? Um, so what would be um, the recommended workflow if I've got um, a lexical resource I want to um, and I want to, to model it or to use the Ontolux Lemon model for it? Uh, how should I, how could I do that? That's, that's a that's a very broad question. I mean, it depends, I guess, a bit on whether this is a case of you know creating a, a new lexical resource from scratch or you know maybe updating an existing lexical resource. Um, obviously, if it's from scratch, you know there are tools to help. Um, particularly, um, Ontolex is supported by the uh, Bock Bench tool, um, which it can be um, a very nice way of kind of working with this kind of um, data. Um, in terms of dealing with an existing resource, it obviously depends a lot on what the existing resource is. Um, we've done, you know, some work on, you know, converting, um, you know, just using transformation and then and then republishing. Um, but often we find, you know, one of the the values of of taking something like Ontolex is that it, it adds a bit of kind of um, it has a certain theory, a certain kind of idea about the representation. This can, you know, reveal maybe some kind of um, issues or some kind of design choices with the original resource that maybe would want to be revised. So it depends a lot on, on the task. And I'm happy to talk about anything like this, you know, further if you want um, offline. But yeah, I mean, it, it depends a lot on kind of what you're trying to do and what, what the outcome you want is. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again thank you john that for your uh, presentation and for being for joining the school